Well, thank you for lingering. I know you, you've been at this conference and you've been studying and learning for many, many days. And the fact that you're willing to come here and do one last day uh, is, is very meaningful to me because I think most of us are like sponges who've already soaked up a lot of water. So I've been praying this morning, the Lord would just put a little bit of extra room into your minds and hearts to absorb what we're gonna talk about today. A very little bit of background on, on myself. First of all, let me introduce, uh, I'm Ken Sandy. My wife, Corlette, is standing in the back. So when I tell some stories, you'll know that it's about us in our marriage. Um, this is my colleague, Chip Zimmer, who's vice president of our ministry. He'll be doing the seminar on Saturday. And this is my son, Jeff. So we are all here to serve you. If there's anything we can do, any questions you have, you can approach any one of us. Um, my background, I was born and raised in Montana. If you know anything about the United States, that's cowboy country. That's where they have cowboys. And in, in Montana, when they say peacemaker, that's what they called a Colt 45 revolver that they used in gunfights. And so that's how they settle conflicts. You shoot the other person, and whoever is fastest on the draw wins the conflict. Um, I don't use that technique today. Um, when I was uh, first out of college, I worked as a mechanical engineer doing medical uh, equipment research and development. I went back to school, went to law school. My father had been a judge. I always had an interest in the law. And right out of law school, instead of going into a regular legal practice, the Lord called me into a ministry called Peacemaker Ministries. And that was established to help Christians resolve lawsuits out of court. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says when you have disputes among each other, even lawsuits, instead of going into the civil courts, turn to the church where the wisdom of God, the grace of God is available to us to resolve our disputes. And that's how I met Chip. He also was involved in that uh, 35 years ago as well. And through that, I saw God do some amazing reconciliation. Situations that were absolutely it seemed impossible to reconcile. In fact, my father, who was not a believer, when he would hear about some of the resolutions we had, the settlements we had, the reconciliations we had, marriages coming back together again, business partners settling lawsuits, churches avoiding splits, um, it was seeing what he finally came to realize, there was a supernatural power. The first one or two times he thought, well, once in a while things work out. But it kept happening that way. And I would come home at night. I was living at home with my folks at first. And my dad would wait up till midnight. And as I walked in, he'd say, what happened? Tell me what, I mean, he was, he knew something supernatural was going on in this process as Jesus moved in and through his people to reconcile their disputes. So that was an exhilarating experience. And by the way, God used that to eventually bring my father to faith shortly before he died. So if nothing else came out of our ministry that my father would see and encounter Jesus and be in heaven for eternity, that's worth it all. But there's been a lot more things that have gone on. But about five years ago, I, I just began getting a longing to get upstream of conflict. It, it's great to reconcile disputes, to tear up divorce papers, to bring people back together again. But there's a lot of energy that goes into resolving conflict that can be used for other things. And even when there's a reconciliation, there's often scars, there's things that are said and done when there's been infidelity, when there's been hurtful things said, we may forgive them, but sometimes it's hard to just really put them completely out of our mind. So I, I began developing a, a desire to develop material that would help people to actually avoid conflict as much as possible. And that's what this new material is about. We still include peacemaking material in the course. I'm not gonna focus a lot on that today. I'm gonna to focus primarily on the, the, the skills that you can develop in your own life to improve your own marriage, your own parenting relationships, your friendships, your work in your ministries, and your witness in your, your broader community. So that's really what our focus is today, is on the preventive principles of relational wisdom. This is normally a six hour seminar. And um, so I'm gonna try to compress everything by about 50%, which means I'll probably go pretty fast over some principles. But if you like what you see, if you see value here, we have an online course that you can do through the internet that goes into much more detail. They're just short 10 minute segments, so they're easier to understand. There's more demonstration videos, there's discussion questions, and all of that is available to you online. 
And ELF will be sending out an article either in June or July uh, promoting that online seminar and providing a discount code for everybody as part of ELF. So with that code, it's a 60% discount. You can actually take the online course for about $12. Now, just to let you know, when I was training in this initially, I took a course in what's called emotional intelligence. How many have heard of emotional intelligence? Okay, a lot of you have. It's a secular cousin, if you will, to what we're studying today. And the course that I took costs thousands of dollars. Um, the course we have online provides actually more content, but we wanted to price it very low so the people in the pews in everyday life would have access to this training. So just because it only costs $12, it's worth a lot more than that. Don't diminish the value just because we've priced it so low. And I hope it's something you can use with your staff uh, in training, just having your staff run better. One of the ways you can think of relational wisdom, it's like lubricating oil in a car engine. When you've got good lubricating oil, there's lots of moving parts, but there's no friction and things run smoothly. If you lose your lubricating oil, your engine overheats and seizes up. And I've seen many churches that seized up and ministries as well. So we're really here as the lubricating oil. So let's, let's get into the content and talk about some of these principles. And along the way, I'll pause and just ask if there's questions. Uh, and if there's a question that comes up, even as I'm going, just raise your hand. We'll pause and engage and deal with whatever issues are important to you. Okay, relational wisdom. First lesson is God created us for relationship. This is the first key principle. We are designed for relationship. What is relational wisdom? Well, relational wisdom in essence is living out the two great commandments that God gave. When, when, when someone approached Jesus and said, what are the greatest commandments? He reduced them down to two simple commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul love your neighbor as yourself. And I think if the person had asked the question, Jesus, what's the most important commandment in the world in one word, and you can't use the word love, I think he would have said relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with other people. That's what our entire existence is about. It's what our purpose is about. It's what our being is about. But it's also the primary target of Satan is the relationships between Christians and their God and Christians and one another. So it's important and it's also the object of an attack. Now, if you want a more modern definition of relational wisdom, it's your ability to discern, to see emotions, interests, motives, and abilities in yourself and in others, to evaluate or interpret that information in light of God's word, and then to use those insights to manage your responses to other people and your relationships in a constructive way. So it involves an observing of other people, of yourself, processing that in the, in the light of what God is showing you about him, himself, and then using that information in a deliberate, thoughtful way to manage relationships and to relate to other people. Now, why is it important to pursue relational wisdom? Well, first of all, as I said, life is all about relationship. You know, at the end of people's lives, you've probably heard this, but nobody is laying in the hospital with two hours to live and says, bring me my stock portfolio. I want to look one more time at the millions of dollars that I've earned. Nobody does that. What they want to do is they're saying, is my son here yet? Have my grandchildren arrived yet? I want to see them one more time. And what's sad is it's, sometimes it takes a crisis to shake the tree and help us to realize the things we've been so consumed about are really not the most important things. Now this picture illustrates this, this point very vividly. In the United States right now, there's a lot of racial tension going on. And I know in many of your countries, the same thing, racial and ethnic tension going on all over the world. And there was a demonstration in Portland, Oregon a while ago, and there was a whole line of people protesting. It was called the Black Lives Matter. It's a, a protest about police uh, dealing uh, too harshly with, with African Americans. And this, so there's a lot of people there demonstrating. There was police on the other side trying to maintain peace. And there was a little boy named Devont Hart who was standing there with a sign that said, free hugs, free hugs. And he was crying. And so this police officer walked across the gap between these two lines up to this young boy and said, why are you crying? 
And he just said, I, I'm just grieved at all that hostility and the anger that's going on in our world today. And the policeman, the policeman said, can I have one of those free hugs? That's what life is about. How do we maintain relationships, show respect for one another, love one another, treat each other with justice, with mercy, with kindness, in the sense that we're together and not divided? Another reason that relational wisdom is important is because relationships are a precious gift, a resource that God entrusts to us to manage for the building of his kingdom. It's, it's what Jesus teaches in Matthew 25, where he says there was a king and he called his servants in and he gave each of them some talents. And that word, it can be talents of gold, some wealth, it's some assets, it's some resources. He puts in their care he says, now invest these resources in a way that would build and extend my kingdom. And then later he comes back, he says, what have you done with those resources? And the one who says, you gave me four talents, I doubled it. I came back with four additional talents. And the king says, well done, good and faithful servant. What does God give to us that is more precious in his sight than our relationships with other people? It's not our company, it's not our BMW, it's not our, our chalet in the mountains. That's nothing, that's dust. But the people you know, your, your spouse, your parents, your friends, your children, your grandchildren, your coworkers, the clerk at the grocery store that every week you walk past and you have a chance to build a relationship and show her you care about her life so that maybe one day when she looks a little bit sad and you say, is there something going on? And she could share with you, maybe her mother went into the hospital with cancer and here you have a chance to minister to her, to take that resource of that relationship that's been in your life for weeks and months and suddenly at the right moment pour in the grace of God, the gospel of Christ into that life. So this is something that drives me is that someday God will ask for an accounting. Ken, what did you do with the relationships I put all around you? Some just for a moment, someone passing, others in your life for many years. Um, let me illustrate, I wanna show you a film clip. One of the things we do in our training, we use a lot of film clips to illustrate these things. It's one thing to say, be thoughtful, be considerate. Okay, that's a concept, but it's when we see people living it out that it really, I think, gets our heart in a, in a powerful way. We end tonight with the football play of the month. It was executed with amazing precision by the Eagles the Olivet Eagles. Steve Hartman has the play and the post-game analysis on the road. Between classes, they schemed and conspired. For weeks, the football players here at Olivet Middle School in Olivet, Michigan, secretly planned their remarkable play. Did anybody go, this is a crazy idea? No, everyone was in on it. But like the coaches didn't know anything about it. So we were like going behind their back. I've just never heard of a team coming up with a plan to not score. It's just like to make someone's day, make someone's week, just make them happy. The play, which was two plays actually, happened at a home game earlier this month. The first part of their plan was to try to get as close to the goal line as possible without scoring, even if it meant taking a dive on the one yard line, which it did. The crowd was not happy. Quarterback Parker Smith. But us kids knew, hey, we got this. This is our time. This is Keith's time. Keith Orr is the little kid in the brown jacket. Hug. He's learning disabled, struggles with boundaries, Hi, but in the sweetest possible way. Hug. Because of his special nature, it's no surprise that Keith embraces his fellow football players. Hug, Gabe. What is surprising is how they have embraced him. Hello. We thought it'd be cool to do something for him because we really wanted to prove that he was part of our team and he meant a lot to us. Nothing can really explain getting a touchdown when you've never had one before. Which brings us to part two of their play. If you didn't see Keith, it's because they were so protective of him. But he was in the middle of that rush. And when you crossed the goal line, what was that like? Awesome. <laughs> it was like, did he just score a touchdown? Get your what? camera out. I'm like, ah, oh, I can't. Keith's parents, Carrie and Jim, almost missed the moment, but they got the significance. Somebody's always going to have his back from now until the day he graduates. She's right. 
when the football team decides you're cool, pretty much everyone follows suit. Today, Keith is a new kid. Although by no means was he the only one who was profoundly changed. What was it like for you? It was like, like once I saw him going, I was smiling like about like here. <laughs> Wide receiver Justice Miller. Like nothing could wipe that smile off my face. Why did it affect you so much? Because like he's never been like cool or popular and he went from being like pretty much a nobody to making everyone's day. Justice admits the play wasn't his idea. I would have not really thought about that. He says it never crossed his mind to give Keith any glory. Well, I kind of went from being somebody like mostly cared about myself and my friends to caring about everyone and trying to make everyone's day and everyone's life. Which may just make that touchdown the most successful football play of all time. Steve Hartman, On the Road, in Olivet, Michigan. I don't know if any of you are skiers. I, I used to ski a lot. And I remember the first time I was skiing in deep powder, and usually you're flailing around and just trying not to fall over and you'd feel awkward. And then suddenly you just get the rhythm and you're just going, your ski is going up and down and you're just gliding through the snow. And it, it just, you're doing, you just got it for that moment. And it's exhilarating to get something just the way it's meant to be. And when people, teenagers, middle schoolers, who basically at that age are normally all wrapped up in themselves uh, and very, they're just all about me. And when they finally realize the experience of loving someone else, serving someone else, it feels so right because that's what God designed them to do. And I think that's one of the most powerful ways we as the church can witness is to help people find what they were designed to do, to love God and to love their neighbor. And maybe the first thing we help them see is to love their neighbor, the exhilaration of serving other people. And then through that, that feels so right, that feels so good, that we can also talk to them and say there's something even better. There's one thing up from that, which is knowing, serving, loving God. Now, we're gonna be talking about a lot of different concepts today, but the, um, the concept that we're gonna, we're, we're also gonna talk about some very simple acrostics that you can just memorize. So in the heat of a moment or you're just, something's going on, you can just fall back on these very simple acrostics and rem remember the key principles. So this is the, the main one we use throughout the seminar, just called the SOG plan, S-O-G. If you just remember S-O-G, self-aware, otherware, God-aware, that's the essence of relational wisdom. That's what we're trying to get to, that we're God-aware, oh, self-aware, what's going on inside of us, and other-aware. And, I, and it, it can have such a profound effect when we learn to just live 24 hours, our waking hours, with all three of those things going on. Where is God? What is he up to? How are other people experiencing life right now? Is there someone I can minister? What's going on inside of me? And at first, it takes a conscious effort. It takes conscious discipline, like learning to play the piano, very one key at a time. But pretty soon, muscle memory, really neural memory, kicks in. And you're doing things without even, you're not thinking G flat and D minor, it's just, it's coming. And these things, as we practice them over and over, become just part of our very character of God as we're conformed to his likeness. Um, as you do these things, there's, there's several benefits that flow from developing these, these skills. Proverbs 4, 7 promises, get wisdom, prize her highly, and she will exalt you. There's so many benefits that flow from, from getting God's wisdom. And we've mentioned three of them in your study guide. Number one is just stronger relationships with God, greater intimacy and closeness with God, a clear conscience, the exhilaration of heartfelt worship, um, closer relationships with other people is also a big part of it. Valued influence in other people's lives. They welcome your counsel. They want you to be there. They will come to you for advice. They see wisdom and grace and love. They feel safe in your presence. They know you're not going to be judging them. And they'll come to you and say, hey, I'm struggling with something. Can you give me some advice? Um, and then uh, finally, a compelling witness. That it's, uh, as we live these things out, people will see something different in us and they will notice. Uh, in my case, as my father saw not only God working in many mediation cases, but he saw God working in my life. Um, when I got out of law school at 28 years old, I was your typical 
28-year-old young man, very proud, very self-sufficient. I knew it all. Even though I was a Christian, I still had enormous issues with pride. And as God saw, or as my dad saw God working in me, uh, pruning off some of that pride, replacing with greater humility and gentleness, my dad thought, there must be a God up there somewhere <laughs> just to see me changing that way. Um, but let me give you an example of, of that SOG plan and the benefits, uh, how they can play out in our lives. When I got out of law school, I was working for a federal judge. It's our national court system in the United States. And he was going to Washington, D.C. to sit on one of the highest courts in our country. Um, and I was his, his clerk. I was working and would do all sorts of research and writing for him. And I got permission that, uh, to leave early on the trip, stop in Chicago, Illinois, and attend a conference of Christian attorneys. And then I would fly on Sunday night so we could be in court on Monday morning. And the, the conference was wonderful. It was a lot like this conference, very casual and informal. And when I was packing my suitcase on Sunday afternoon, I suddenly realized I'd forgot to put in a white dress shirt to wear with a suit and tie, which is required for being in court. So I didn't have the proper clothes to be in court the next day. I was at a conference. I didn't know how to get to a clothing store. I just totally panicked. I was just um, in, in a huge, huge panic. And so <clears throat> I was standing down in the foyer uh, thinking, what am I going to do? And one of the keynote speakers, the plenary speakers, who was on the board of directors of this organization, very respected attorney, he was going to give the closing plenary. He was walking through the lobby. Surely he was focusing on, you know, what am I going to do? He was thinking about his project. And he had never met me, he didn't know my name or anything like that, but he walked past me in the foyer, he got about two or three steps beyond me, and he stopped, turned around, and walked back and said, are you okay? Just out of the side of his eyes, he had noticed a distressed look on my face. He had cultivated a gift of other awareness, of empathy, that he could read just my facial expression and see there was distress in my heart. God has given us that capacity. He's given us eyes. We can hear the tone of voice. Someone's voice may be different. Maybe they're walking more slowly. There's a sense of despondency, even in how they move across the room. Do we pick up on that data? Well, he did. He picked up on it, came back and said, are you okay? And I went, no. And I, I blurted out my problem to him. And he reached his pocket, pulled out his car keys. He didn't even know my name. He said, my car's out in the parking lot. It's in the front row. There's a, there's a mall down the road. You can go down there. Do you need some money? I will never forget that. I will never forget that. 35 years later. There's a saying, people will forget what you say. They will forget what you do. They will never forget how you make them feel. And he made me feel love. Deeply and profoundly loved. So those are the benefits we have as we develop these things. Stronger relationships, valued influence, and a compelling witness. Now I want you to think of relational wisdom, these basic skills, as an operating system for life. An operating system for life. This is not a seminar on skills you can use in the workplace to be more effective as a team. These are not skills that are just for a better marriage. These are skills that you can use in the workplace to work better with your coworkers. It's something you work in your ministries, you go out into your community and serve people. It's skills you can use with your spouse when you wake up in the morning and your teenagers as they come home in the afternoon. These skills apply to every relationship, every waking hour of your life, which means an investment improving these skills can benefit every aspect of your life. They affect everything in your life. Okay, let's talk about a second concept here that's closely related about the importance of soft skills. Now, when I worked as an engineer, I hired other engineers for our, our team, technicians and engineers. And I would look at their resumes, which was their hard skills, their technical abilities. Um, did they have the degree that we needed? Did they have the experience we needed? Had they published papers? What kind of a grade point average did they have in school? All these things would indicate their skills, their technical abilities. Well, I learned the hard way that you can hire somebody with an outstanding resume who's a disaster as an employee. 
And, and the person with the most impressive resume I've ever seen turned out to be the most disastrous employee I ever hired. He, he nearly destroyed the team. And because there's this other aspect of life called soft skills or relational abilities, communication, empathy, conflict resolution, humility, can receive criticism, can offer advice in a, in a winsome and constructive way, um, can negotiate effectively, bringing people together where everybody says that's a good solution. And so those are the two things that really contribute to our value to a group. And not just in an engineering firm. It could be a mission team on the field. It could be a pastor in the pulpit. I worked with many pastors who had wonderful skills in the pulpit. They could exegete God's word and preach it with power. And yet they were a disaster relating to their people. They did not know how to love their people. And that can destroy you. And the reason that those soft skills are so important is this formula is actually not written properly. The operand is not a plus sign. Because if it was, you could be a 10 out of 10 on hard skills, just excellent hard skills. And if you're a zero in your soft skills, 10 plus zero is still 10. But 10 times zero is zero. You could have someone with outstanding hard skills and could be so weak personally and relationally it just cancels not only their value, but it can actually diminish the value of other people's skills. In my case, this one employee was just so insecure that he couldn't stand it when someone else on the team excelled. And so if they did something well, he would be sarcastic, he would downplay what they did. He was affecting other people through his insecurities. So soft skills magnify or diminish the value of our hard skills as well as those of the people around us. The, these, the skills that Chris demonstrated, these are the soft skills, the relational skills, and they build bonds of loyalty, trust, and mutual support. It's called social capital. It's like investing in a bank account. And when people come into your ministry, into your church every day, they show empathy for one another. They encourage one another. They, they wanna see the other person excel and succeed. It's like they're making deposits in that account day after day of supporting each other, encouraging each other, loving each other. And then if one day one of them is going through some really hard things and comes into the office and is just grumpy and irritable, the other people can, can look at it and say, well, that's not typical. And they basically take some withdrawals from that account of all that goodwill that's been built up over months and years to cut that person some grace and come alongside that person. So not only within your team can you build up social capital, but even in the people you work with, the people you go out into the world, into the community, the village, um, the orphanages, wherever you go to minister, you're slowly building social capital through relationships that eventually gives you the ability to speak into their lives with the gospel. And so it makes groups more creative, more productive, more profitable, more enjoyable. There's a recent blog on our website where they've connected the fact that when you, when companies, these are business companies, invest in relational training for their staff and in skills that the staff can take home and actually apply at home as well as in the office, the return to the business, it actually returns financially to the business, sometimes as much as 600%. For every dollar you spend training, the company actually enjoys a $6 return because what happens is your team is more productive, more creative, you have lower staff turnover, you're not hiring new people all the time, bringing them back up to speed. It just makes the whole company actually more profitable, even in a bottom line financial sense, much less a more enjoyable place to live and work. So these skills really do have a very, very major impact on how we live. Um, one of the questions that comes up a lot is, can people actually change their relational skills? In America, we have an old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I've had men come up and tell me that. You know, they, were, they were brought to a seminar by their wife. <laughs> the man really didn't want to be there, but his wife dragged him along to the seminar. And he comes up and says, hey, come on. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. And if it's a little way into the seminar where I feel I've gotten somewhat of an emotional bond with the audience, I'll look at the guy and I'll say, turn around. And he go, what? Turn around for a minute. So what are you talking about? Well, just turn around. He turns around and says, you don't have a tail. You're not a dog. You are a human being made in the image of God. And you are called to be conformed to his likeness. And the Bible even promises we are being transformed 
into the likeness of Christ. It's not instant. It is a slow, steady process. But over time, as the Lord works in us through His Spirit, we can change. And I am living proof of this. Um, when I started developing this material five years ago, I shared it with my family, my, my wife and two children. And my wife, Corlette, was looking at me and she said, well, I think this could be very valuable. And I could just tell from the tone of voice there was something else that she was thinking. I said, okay, what else are you thinking? And she said, well, if you're going to be teaching this, there's some room for growth in your life. Now, that's after 27 years of marriage. And she was absolutely true, absolutely right. There has always been room. There still is room. But I think she would tell you, you can interview her during the break if you want, because Ken actually changed. And I think I have in a lot of ways. I'll share some of that. And I'm still in process. I still blow it. But God is, is working. So what I want to encourage you, some people will come up and say, you know, oh, I wish I'd learned this 30 years ago. When my kids are still home. They're grown. And my adult <laughs> daughter isn't speaking to me. And they've got all sorts of regret. I just encourage you. Don't look back in the past with regret. Um, we can learn from our mistakes. We can believe in the promise of the gospel that through Christ, our sins have been forgiven. In his sight, we are righteous. And he will use even those mistakes of the past sometimes as part of his transforming process. I love the passage in scripture where it says he takes ashes and turns them into beauty. And so it's never too late for a Christian to start doing what's right. So just be encouraged about that. Let's talk for just a moment about this idea of emotions. Emotions um, play a big part in human relationships, huge part. Let me show you a video clip that illustrates the power of emotions and really how differently people often handle emotions. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, well, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can go? It, it sort of illustrates sort of two broad categories of people in this world. Um, one group is the group that I'm in, which I'm a fixer. I, I'm an engineer and I'm a lawyer. And as soon as my family, my son, my wife, they, they'll bring a problem to me and they give just a little bit of it. I say, okay, that's enough. I, let me tell you what to do. I mean, that is me. I just jump right to a solution without even hearing the whole thing. And all three of them have told me, dad, Please just don't try to fix everything right away. So I'm a fixer. I need to move away from that. Now, there's other people in the world who are feelers. They, they feel things deeply and profoundly. And they feel things deeply and profoundly. And they feel things. And they just keep on feeling things. And they will just keep on feeling things. And they need to realize there comes a point that after you've communicated those things, and it's legitimate, then we do try to need to move to, okay, now how do we respond to this situation? So you sort of come like this toward each other. Now, to really make that illustration more meaningful, think of this. The, the nail on the head, it's so obvious. She looks foolish in it. But think of it this way. Maybe what she's saying in real life is, my mother is coming to visit again, and I just can't stand it when she's here. 
It's, it's the worst time of the year when my mother comes. And the husband is seeing his wife interact with his mother-in-law, and he knows his mother-in-law's got some characteristics, but he's also seeing his wife do some things, you know, where she provokes the mom and does something. So if he jumps right to telling his wife, well, here's what you need to do differently, without really empathizing with her, connecting with her emotionally, even, even if the issue is very apparent to him, she's not going to be able to hear him until she believes that he understands. That's one of the reasons the Bible says to weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, enter into the emotion of their life. The word compassion means co-suffering. It's to feel what they feel. So very important thing. Now, when it comes to emotions, I'm gonna give you a quick little um, condensation of a PhD in emotions <laughs> in five minutes. Um, the brain is an incredibly complex thing. And in my opinion, the people who should be most interested in studying the brain should be Christians. Because it is really the pinnacle of God's creation in one sense. That is where we have the capacity for Christ-likeness, knowledge, righteousness, holiness. But the fact is, the average Christian, all he knows about the brain is it's located somewhere between the ears. We, we know nothing about the brain. And I hope after this seminar, you will develop a thirst and a hunger to know more about how the human brain works. It is so incredible. But let me give you a very simple description of some broad principles. Um, the brain, you could divide into two major parts. There's actually dozens of subparts, but two major parts. The limbic, <coughs> limbic system sits right on top of the spinal cord. It's a, it's a part of the brain right here, and this is where most of the emotional content or activity of brain takes place. Now that's a big oversimplification because the more they study the brain, the more they find out there's all sorts of things going on all the time that contribute to emotions. But most of it takes place in what's called the limbic system. Up in this part of the brain is what we call the neocortex. That's the reasoning, the uh, impulse control, it's where we remember sermons and books we've read, uh, language skills. So we have both an emotional part of the brain and then more of a rational thinking part. Now, humans are filled with an emotional capacity. God designed emotions. They're hardwired into our brain. Emotions are not the result of the fall. I'm going to say it again. Emotions are not the result. Of, there's some Christians almost think like before the fall, people weren't emotional. And, and that's simply not true. Our design is inherently, our brain is inherently designed with an emotional capacity. But what the fall did is it twisted, like everything else. Our bodies now are corrupted by the fall, they age, they become ill, and we die. And our brains, our will, has also been corrupted and twisted. So sometimes we think properly and reasonably and graciously, and other times things provoke us. But the, the, our languages, English language, Polish language, Czech language, all of our languages have got hundreds of emotional words, hundreds of them. And the Bible has dozens and hundreds of emotional words as well. There's many ways to organize, uh, ways to look at and evaluate emotions. Uh, lots of psychologists spend their whole lives developing very complicated ways of evaluating emotions. I've given you just a very simple version here, eight, eight broad categories. You see in your study guide a chart that has over 100 emotional terms in it. That's just a small fraction of the English words on emotions. But you can see there's degrees of emotion in each of these categories. And you know, we could, in a very general sense, divide them into three broad categories. Over here are categories that could be related to fear, that, that make us withdraw from people. Things happen and we pull away um, from people. Over here we could have some things that might be organized under sort of a sense of anger, things that make us aggressive or defensive toward other people. And then in the middle we have sort of some broad emotions here that we could talk about as love, more positive emotions. And the Bible has hundreds of passages speaking about emotions, <clears throat> hundreds of them. And for example, 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, the writer knows we wrestle with fear. In fact, the most common phrase in the, in the Bible, fear not, <laughs> fear not, fear not. God knows we wrestle with fear. But he's, he's not given us a spirit of fear. That's not how we're designed to be, is to be dominated by fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. And he cautions us again and again in Scripture to be on guard against a spirit of anger 
which can well up inside of us and cause us to say and do things that are hurtful. So the Bible speaks a lot about emotions. Now, emotions are physiological experiences. We can now, with functional MRIs, this is where you put someone in a machine and they can see the blood flow in your brain and it tells you what part of the brain is most active. So fascinating studies that are coming up on how the brain works. And we now, we can measure that when we have intense emotions, they, they have neural brain activity. They affect our muscles. We can tighten up, our, our stomach can tighten up our muscles. We can feel our muscles tense up. We can start breathing more rapidly. Uh, if there's hormones now being pumped into our system of fear and fight flight, our heart is beating. Um, and all of these things contribute. They affect what we're doing and thinking. We make decisions as a result of these things. And they move us to action. And this is the key thing I want you to get. The, the emotions are designed to move us. They have a God-given purpose to move us. The word emotion comes from a Latin word which means to move. To move. And they move us, sometimes positively, but sometimes negatively. And we see in the Bible many examples of godly behavior. Jesus came up out of the Sea of Galilee. He saw the people. They were helpless without a shepherd. He was moved to minister to them. But then we also see examples in the Bible where people were moved in uh, sinful ways. Joseph's brothers were jealous of him, and they were moved to sell him into slavery. So emotions can either be positive or negative. Um, emotions give us our greatest pleasures. This is my grandson, Andrew. Um, the study guide you're working on, that's something he typed up for me a little while ago. I'm kidding. Um, he, he loves the keyboard, though. He just gets on that keyboard, and he sometimes has done massive editing on my documents before I realize what's going on. But just seeing him, hearing his voice, literally just thinking about him gives me joy, gives me pleasure. Um, my other grandchildren, um, Malachi and Brielle, I just, when I see them, we've been here for 10 days, we FaceTime with them, we see them looking at us and talking, ah, just joy. My wife, my, my son, my daughter, they give me joy. So that's a great thing about emotions. But emotions can also cause us great pain. Our greatest grieving and, and pain in life um, comes from emotions usually connected to relationships. And a basic rule of life is we're not usually deeply hurt by strangers. Our deepest hurts in life for most of us come from someone very close to us. It's when someone divorces us. It's when a child turns against us and will not speak to us. It's when a close friend suddenly betrays us. And even David talks about this. He talks about a friend who used to go up and worship with him in the temple who has betrayed him. And it causes grief. And these offenses, they, they put a wall between us when we've been deeply hurt by somebody. And yet, because of that connection, it's, this picture is a great illustration, there's still a connection here. We, we want to stay connected, but we've been hurt. And there's a wall and there's fear. If I, if I get close again, if I let that wall come down, I could be hurt again. And so we struggle with trusting someone again in those relationships. So this is a, it's an ongoing struggle of human life. Now, s emotions are not inherently sinful. This is really important to realize. They're not emotionally or inherently sinful. Jesus was described as having a wide variety of emotions. Love, anger, compassion, joy, pity, agony, sorrow. All sorts of emotions with Jesus. But they never surprised him. They never overpowered him. They never moved him to sin. Now, in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was a lot of emotional pressure. The natural fear God has built into us, when we know there's a threat to our bodily well-being, you know, there's a, someone coming at us with a knife or a car coming. I mean, we're naturally designed to get away from things that will hurt us. And so Jesus was experiencing that natural fear, knowing what was going to happen. And yet he was able to master, to take those emotions captive and still walk up that hill and be sacrificed on our behalf. Um, he never sinned. He was never moved to sin. That's not the case with us. We're all like sort of a, a, a computer board that has a, a bad circuit. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Most of the days we're pleasant to our wife and we're agreeable to our children. We get along with our coworkers. But we've all had moments where we said or did things that were just impulsive, selfish, 
out of anger, out of fear. And so sometimes those circuits don't work and we say and do hurtful things. <clears throat> but the good news is God has redeemed our emotions. This is such good news. We are not left to just wallow in our sin and just totally decay. And we have all these wonderful promises, one in 2 Corinthians. Beholding the glory of God, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is a spirit. And I love this picture. I think it just illustrates. Here's a man who could probably be doing all sorts of enjoyable recreation things, golfing or skiing or sailing with his time and his money. And yet his heart has been moved. It's been touched by God to instead go to some place that's probably not very comfortable to live in. The facilities, the accommodations may not be comfortable. And yet his heart is moved to imitate the love of Christ, the compassion of Christ, to minister to people. And this is what God wants to do in us, to transform us, that we would, we would be dominated primarily by emotions that really do move us in positive ways. There's a particular aspect of emotions that it's really important for us to think about, and it's called hijacking. It's like when someone gets on an airplane with a gun and says, I'm taking over this airplane, you're gonna fly where I wanna go. Um, we've all heard of hijackings. Um, and let me explain the neurology of hijacking. In high stress, high stress situations, the emotional brain, the limbic system, can take over control of our body, hijack the rest of our brain, and cause us to say and do things we later regret. A little bit noisy. Remind me to open that in a minute so it doesn't get too hot. But what happens is this. Some stimulation comes in through the, the spinal cord from our eyes or our ears. We see something or hear something, and it triggers an emotion. And what's going on here, it's, it's primarily going on something called the amygdala. And you can think of the amygdala as a room in your brain with all these filing cabinets, and they've got experiences of life, your third grade birthday party, uh, Christmas when you were 12, your, your wedding, your engagement, your divorce, your being forced out of your church, all the experiences of life. And with each of those little files, there's an emotional tag. Some are green, some are blue, some are pleasant, some are unpleasant. And when that same experience happens again, something reminds us, taps into that experience, it will trigger that emotion. And so it can trigger either pleasant ones or very unpleasant ones. And so we have this moment of an intense emotional reaction that's triggered very quickly. And what happens here is just the geography of the brain works against us. The stimulation comes into the limbic system, to the amygdala, amygdala triggers a reaction, and we give into it before the stimulation gets to the neocortex and says, now hold it, that really would not be a smart thing to do. Let me give you an example. Maybe somebody as a child was criticized a lot by his parents. Just always criticized, totally would never amount to anything. He just has this deep pain of constant criticism and rejection from his parents. He's now working in a company, and they're having a team meeting, and his supervisor uh, says something about a project he did that's somewhat critical in front of the rest of the team. It taps into that memory of being constantly criticized by his parents, evokes the emotion, he blurts out something in anger toward his supervisor in front of all of his coworkers, and has just done a lot of damage to his working relationship because he couldn't control his mouth. So that would just be an example. Another one would be maybe you had a bad experience with snakes or something, and just seeing a snake, you just, you just jump before you even think about it. So that's what uh, emotional hijacking is like. Let me show you an example of hijacking. And this is from a movie called Cinderella Man. It's a story, a true story, about an American boxer who just before the Depression in the 1920s was very successful. The global depression came on and the economies just collapsed around the world and he lost all of his money. So he's living in a little apartment struggling to bring food home by working, loading ships down at the wharf. And um, he finally gets a chance to get back into the boxing ring in a fight and regain his, his, his title. But the man he's gonna fight against has killed two other people in the ring. Just hit them so hard, the brain damage killed them. So this man's wife is understandably very fearful 
about this upcoming thing. I mean, things are hard enough as it is. We've got three kids. If he gets killed, she's in a much worse position. So you can imagine what's going on inside of her. So watch as this scene unfolds. This is a couple of days before the fight. You can see the emotions building in her steadily. You'll notice that he is not being very other aware. He's not reading his wife very well. And finally, there's this explosion. All right, three punch combo, okay? Pop, pop, bang. Come on. Yeah. Oh, that's good. One more time. Keep your thumbs tucked in. Keep your elbows in. All right, that's enough now. Oh, I'm staying in that. That's enough, please. Yeah, that's good. Bang. I'm not doing that. All right. Hey, where's the defense? Come on. Keep your hands. I want to Bang, 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 bang. Come on, Howie, Howie. <laughs> no, no boxing in the house. No boxing out of the house, all right? No boxing, period. You're going to stay in school, and then you're going to go to college, and you're going to have professions, because you're not going to have your skull smashed in, too. Do you understand me? Is that clear? Always gonna get ready for bed, right? Jimmy, what's worth it? Huh? What's worth it? I have to believe I got some kind of say over our lives. Okay? You know, that things are bad, that we can change them. We can make things better for our family. But I need you to be safe. Nothing so safe anymore, mate. And without that, Jimmy, I need nothing you to safe be at safe. all. All right. All right. I have stood by for all of it. Until now. Not for this, Jimmy. I just can't. So, you train all you want. Make a show of it for yourself, for the papers. But you find a way out of that fight. Break your hand again if you have to. The, the basic thing we're looking at here is this idea of hijacking where our emotions overtake us for a moment. There's a related concept called flooding. And that's where it's not just a momentary thing, but the emotions just keep coming and coming like waves at the ocean, and they overwhelm us. And when there's flooding going on, that can just drive people away from us. It can drive us away from other people if we don't know how to control the power of our emotions. And as I've been here this week, a lot of people, um, we've had conversations that in their culture, either some cultures just keep all the emotions stuffed inside and don't share them, and other emotions, they just, they just come gushing out. And so either extreme of either stuffing them or just giving them full reign can cause damage to relationships. And we need, how to, need to learn how to, how do we handle that power constructively? You know, here's a more detailed way of, of things that happen. Something triggers an offense, we're offended, maybe we're criticized, someone says something we don't like, we're offended, we become defensive about it, automatically try to defend ourselves. Um, anger can develop from that. We don't like how we're being treated. We feel anger welling up. People, many times, if things happen again and again, they develop a victim mentality. Others are always oppressing me. It's not my fault, the things I'm doing. It's their fault. And victims feel helpless. They feel like there's nothing I can do to change because they don't think it's their fault in the first place. And they're trapped. Develop a critical attitude toward the other person. All they see is the criticism. If you have a boss that has hurt you, you may eventually get the attitude, just all you can see is his flaws. You just see all the bad things. 
we can get so overwhelmed with our emotions, our brain just can't process them all. We start getting confused. We're not thinking clearly. And we're overwhelmed. We get developed hopelessness. A hardness of heart comes in and a relational failure. This is how divorces happen. This is how church splits happen. This is how people are fired from a job, is they go that downward spiral. In very simple terms, as emotions increase, our reasoning capacity decreases. And there's actually another physiological process that goes on here. When we're experiencing intense emotions, let's say you're going to the office, you know you're about to have a job performance review for the year, you're nervous, you don't think your boss likes you very much, is looking for an excuse to fire you, and so all the way to the office, this fear is building and building. So the limbic part of your brain, the emotional part, is just churning with emotions. Well, intense emotions, intense brain activity requires fuel. And that fuel, part of it is oxygen. The brain needs lots of oxygen. And so the blood vessels to the amygdala get bigger. They dilate. So more blood is flowing into the amygdala. But what happens is the blood vessels that go to the neocortex restrict. And less blood is actually going to the part that gives you impulse control, controls your languages, your logic, your reasoning. So you go into that job performance review and your emotions are churning. The part of you that would control you and get you to say very reasonable things, not take offense easily, is, is sort of diminished. And the boss says something, you explode, you lose your job. That'd be an example of how this can happen. So that's the problem. To put it another way, our emotions are often like an invisible puppeteer. They are there. They are controlling us. Most of us have never thought about them. We've not, and we don't understand how they work physically. We don't understand what they're doing spiritually. They're just jerking us around, saying and do things. We have high divorce rate. We have broken families. We have fragmented churches. We have communities filled with conflict because there's all these people being controlled by this invisible puppeteer. And the whole point of relational wisdom, of what we're trying to teach, is let's bring that puppeteer out in the open. Let's understand how that puppeteer, our emotions, work. Let's cut these strings and say, I want to take my emotions captive to Christ. My words captive to Christ. My thoughts captive to Christ. Okay, um, we're going to have a break in about 10 minutes. So let me just hit a couple of more things here. I want to start into the paradigm we focused so far for the first hour. What are some of the struggles, potential problems in relationships and emotions? Let's now move toward solution. God doesn't want to leave us in this state of the invisible puppeteer. So we're designed to relate in a healthy, constructive way to God, to ourselves, and others. We saw this verse earlier. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's how we are designed. So here's a, here's, a, here's a biblical theology for emotions. And as you know, a systematic theology just takes what the Bible teaches on a concept and sort of organizes it in a way where we can understand it more easily. So this is just a way of organizing biblical content about emotions. And there's two, two main things I want to communicate. Number one, we are inherently three-dimensional in our emotions. We're designed to relate to God, we're designed to relate to ourselves, and we're designed to relate to other people. Now some people, when I say we're designed to relate to ourselves, they go, really? Yes, we are. In fact, there's nobody you relate to more than yourselves. This is why we see the psalmist saying, why are you downcast, oh my soul? Why so discouraged deep within me? There's some healthy introspection in scripture. And even all the great philosophers, Socrates, Plato, they said, know thyself. If you don't know what's driving you, if you don't know how your desires, your passions, your dreams are moving you, you won't be able to control them. You've got to understand what's going on inside of yourself. And that gives us the other component of this, is there's two dynamics, two things going on in each dimension. One is an awareness component. What do I know about God? Who he is, what he's like, what his purposes are what his promises are, what his character is. What do I know about God? What do I know about myself, um, my, my strengths, my weaknesses, where I'm vulnerable to temptation, where I could lose my temper, what my gifts, my dreams are? Do we know ourselves? And then 
What do I know about the other person? Am I aware of the people around me? Am I reading their body language? Am I listening to their voice? Am I understanding their words? What their dreams are, their hopes, their weaknesses, their challenges. So there's an awareness component, which is what do I know? And then there's an engaging component, an action component. What will I do? And so how will I respond to God? The Bible talks about obedience, faithfulness, trust, worship. Those are active things that we do. What am I going to do with my own desires? How do I take the knowledge about myself and engage or manage myself? Self-discipline, self-control, um, putting off sinful emotions, forgiving other people. These are choices we have to make. We have to decide to manage our thoughts, our words, our actions. And then finally over here, how do I engage other people? The Bible has so many commands, so many imperatives. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, weep with those who weep. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of passages. In fact, I would submit to you, I don't think there's a passage in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that doesn't fit in one of these three areas. All of scripture is about how we re relate to God, how we manage ourselves and love our neighbors. So all of the Bible fits into that paradigm. Um, that's the basic structure of these six skills we'll be looking at in this seminar. Now, as you know, the Bible doesn't use the phrase God aware, but it does say, remember the Lord your God. Remember the one who brought you out of Egypt. Constantly calling us to think about and remember what we know. It doesn't use the word God engaging, but it does talk about faithfulness, consistent obedience. Humility would be a synonym for self-awareness. Can we honestly look at ourselves in humility? Self-discipline for the self-awareness. Compassion would be a biblical term we could use for this category. And serving, serving other people would be a word there. So if you prefer to use those words, they're, they're, just, uh, they're just as biblical. I mean, they're biblical terms. Um, we also developed a secular version of our material. This is really an evangelistic tool. And this is something where we can go into a secular setting, a military base, police department, public school, um, hospitals and teach these things. And instead of being God aware and God engaging, we say values aware, values engaging. So we, we eliminate the overtly biblical language. We use this model to go in and teach the skills I'll be talking to you about in a few minutes, some basic simple skills. And there's a lot of people out there that aren't professing Christians that by God's common grace can learn these skills. And thank God that people who may not be believers still will obey the traffic laws and they don't rob banks. And most people in this world actually behave in a fairly sociable way or our societies would just fall apart. But the great thing is after we teach this, what we'll usually say is if there's anyone here who would like to see a faith-based version, I've got some literature up here you can look at. And every time we do that, it's all gone. I mean, people come up, they grab it, and it's something that can then lead them to the biblical version of it. And sometimes in some settings, like if I go into a Christian-owned business, we'll teach this view to all the employees. And at the end of it, I'll usually have the owner get up and say, you know, I thank you for coming in. These are good things. Let me just share with you my version of this. And we'll put up the God-aware, God-engaging, and the employer, the owner of the business, will give his own personal testimony on how God is the one where he gets his values from he gives him the strength to change and to grow. So he has a chance to share his faith, but it's in a way that is acceptable. Um, you'll find that these principles are taught all over the Bible. And in fact, there's many passages in scripture we call 360 passages. They basically start with God awareness, God engagement. They go all the way around and they end with this. These are, it's like a bookend. So in, in Ephesians 4.30, for example, just one of many passages, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's God awareness, God engagement. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor, slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Self-awareness, self-engagement. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Other awareness, other engagement. As God in Christ forgave you, God awareness. And these, these are what theologians call the indicative passages. They indicate who God is, what he's like. They're like bookends to the imperatives, the commandments. And they're the motivational parts of scripture. Another very well-known section that does the same dynamic is the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments doesn't start 
with thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's an introduction to the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then there's ten implied therefores. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. Therefore, you shall have no idols. It's understanding who God is and what he's done that motivates us to do these things. So when I'm counseling people who are are struggling in their relationships, I usually find they're weak on this. They've taken their eyes off God. They're just focused on their struggle, this relationship. And we need to really get them back thinking, reminding them of who God is, what he's like, what he's up to. But let's, let's look into I, what I want to do now in the limited time we have left. I, I'm, I'm hoping this class will be an appetizer, if you will. You've tasted some of these things and you want to have the full feast, which is available through the online course. Um, so let's talk about these acrostics a little bit more. The church has used acrostics for millennia. And an acrostic is simply a simplified memory device to to help us remember important theological concepts or any any kind of concept. Um, In the early church, there was the the fish symbol was an acrostic that stood for the Greek word fish, those letters stood for these words, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. That's one of the earliest acrostics in the church. So someone once told me that our acrostics were just overly simple. I said, you know, The church has used really simple things to convey very profound truth for uh, centuries. So let me give you just a few of the acrostics here you can start using in your life. One of them is something we call the SOG plan. And the SOG plan, we looked at earlier, has these three components, self-awareness, other awareness, God awareness. And if you can just remember that one acrostic, you will have gotten the essence of this training, just that one acrostic. Let me give you an example of how that, um, <clears throat> that, that concept worked in my, uh, my family. When my son Jeff was 18, about to graduate from high school, um, he would come to me and he would say, Dad, Mom is driving me crazy. He said, no matter what I do, you know, there's something she thinks I should be more consistent in my homework or... Be, be studying the Bible and have regular devotions, or maybe my friends aren't the best, and no, no matter what I do, as soon as I'm doing what she wants, there's another thing she wants me to do. It says I can never satisfy her. And Je- I, I, as I work with Jeff, it, I helped him understand moms are like contractors, like people who build houses. And the last thing that a contractor does, he goes through the house with something called a punch list. And a punch list is not a list of everything that is done well. It's a list of all the things that still aren't as good as they should be. The the carpeting is coming up, or there's some paint that's chipped, or a door is sticking. And a good contractor wants to sell and deliver a perfect house. And that's how mothers are. They want to launch their kids into life with good spiritual disciplines and friendships and healthy eating habits and all these things. And so there was this tension between Corlette, who's a very devoted mother, I mean, incredibly conscientious mother, and my son, who's a normal teenager, who's just going, oh. So when Jeff began to understand the SOG plan, he actually gave a talk to the high school group in our church. And he explained this whole RW concept, and he used this story, this relationship with his mother, is an illustration. And I'd only given him like 45 minutes of teaching on this whole concept. And he was able to do an hour teaching to his peers. So it shows you how really simple this is in one sense. And he started talking about, he described the relationship with his mother, and he actually asked us to come and listen to his talk that night. We thought, well, that'll be interesting. So we came, we're sitting in the back row, and all the teenagers are, why are they here? And Jeff is teaching about RW. And he described the tension between him and his mother. And by the way, sometimes fathers are the ones that are perfectionists. This is not confined to mothers. Um, You usually find one of them is a little bit more like this. Um, So Jeff described the situation. And of course, all the kids in the room could relate to it. They all had one parent who was trying to perfect them. But then he said, but I began to relate to my mother differently when I looked at it through these three things. The self-awareness. 
Why do I resent so much when she's trying to correct me? He said to his friends, well, you all know the answer to that. I've got incredible pride. Some of you have come and tried to you know, share a concern with me, and, and you know how defensive I can be. And it's pride, it's self-righteousness, that anybody who corrects me, I, I don't like it, I hate it. And I realize, God, this is how you're trying to change me and transform me. So just becoming aware of his own heart, why he was reacting the way he did. He then talked about God awareness. And he said, um, where's God in this? And he said, you know, my dad's been trying to help me for years to really understand the biblical teaching on spiritual authority, that every authority in the world is established by God in government, in the church, and in the home. And my mother is a governor sent by God to rule in my life. And every time I resent her, criticize her, argue with her, I'm resisting God. And I'd been telling him this for years, but it finally began to sink in that God is calling us, honor your father and your mother, obey your parents. And he began to really own that, not just have me tell him, but to own that biblical truth. And then he talked about the other awareness. He said, you know, I, I began to look at this through my mother's eyes. I thought, well, how's she look at this? He says, my mother's got two professional degrees. She could be working outside the home in a very fulfilling career where people actually say thank you for all the things she does. And instead, every day she gets up and she pours herself out for her family, for her children, for her husband, giving to us, looking out for us, wanting the best for us. She sacrificed everything to build her family to love us. Well, by this time, of course, all the girls in the room are crying, and they're feeling bad about how they, they're rude to their mothers, and they want to go home and hug their mothers. But I was watching these teenagers, all of them about 18 years old. At first, they thought, well, this is sort of funny, ha-ha. But they began to think about these things, and, and they really did. Some of them were changed by it, hearing his testimony. So just simply looking at life, all these components are always involved in any relationship. And we can develop a discipline and a skill to do this. And so again, to use the analogy of a piano, when you first start, you play with one hand, and then you're doing two, and you're going like this. And these things can begin to weave together. You don't even realize you're doing it. It's just Christ's character coming out in you. So um, what I want to do is show you an example of someone living out these, these skills. This is from a movie called um, Spanglish. And it's about a, a, a Mexican woman immigrating illegally into the United States with her daughter. And immigration is a big issue in the United States right now. I know it's a big issue in Europe, too. There's lots of complicated issues. This Hispanic woman comes in the United States, gets a job as a housekeeper with an American family. That family really loves her. She's a very relational person they almost make her and her daughter part of the family. And the mother, the American mother, really likes the little girl whose name is Christina. And she takes her out for hairdos and buys her clothes and gets her a scholarship into a private school. I mean, this little Spanish girl is loving this. But the mother starts to see that she's, her daughter is being pulled out of the Hispanic community into the dominant Anglo community. She's, she feels like she's losing her daughter. And out of that, she also, there's a, a relationship developing between Flor, the Hispanic mother, and the American man in the household. They're starting to feel a romantic attraction. So the, the mother, Flor, realizes this is not a good situation, and she quits her job. The scene you're about to see is where she has just told her daughter they're leaving. They've been living in this mansion. They've been getting all these benefits. They've got a swimming pool. This little girl loves this life. And now her mother says, we're leaving. And the little girl is really distressed. You'll see early in the clip, the little girl says, well, can I still stay with them if I'm late at school? And the mother says, well, sorry, but I'm also taking you out of the school. And the daughter just explodes. Perfect example of emotional hijacking. Watch how the mother handles it. Totally in control of her emotions. Uh, try to imagine what she's feeling during this scene. Just try to imagine her emotions. How would you feel? The mother does some very wise things in this scene. She gives her daughter time to calm down. She doesn't lecture her daughter. If you've got teenagers, you know that you cannot successfully lecture a teenager. 
she uses a question. Because questions get into the mind and they force people to start thinking. You'll see the mother use some emotion. She displays some emotions. There's some tears running down her cheek, but she doesn't turn her emotions up full bore and just overwhelm her daughter. She has just enough to say, this is really important. I care about you. Um, and and it's, it's emotion in the most positive way of compassion and love. You'll hear the daughter narrating. Uh, her voice is sort of explaining the scene because she's actually telling the story years later in the movie. But it's a perfect example of relational. Well, let's talk about a few other things. I mentioned relational wisdom, our emotional intelligence. Here's the classic EI formulation. Self-awareness, self-management, self-social awareness, relation. It's the bottom two-thirds of our circle, okay? So it's missing that top component. And the problem with um, emotional intelligence, there, there's some real valuable information. I, I recommend Goldman's books but you've got to bring in biblical truth to supplement it and to filter it. Because number one, the motivation for EI, most of the programs sell it by saying, if you learn these skills, you'll make more money, you'll climb the corporate ladder, you'll be more successful. So it's all about me and self-benefit. Secondly, the power to change is self-will, determination, discipline. Well, how far does that get us? <laughs> There's so many things I want to change in my life and I make some progress and slide back. I need a savior. I need the Holy Spirit in my life. But there's also this side, it's called the dark side of EI. What is the dark side of EI? People with really good emotional relational skills. Manipulative, they, they know what's important to you, they know what you like to hear and they say it and they manipulate you. And there's a lot of articles even on our website about the problems here. Um, so it, this creates an opportunity for us as Christians though, because EI is such a big concept all around the world today. The premier of China in a major conference in Beijing with all their top corporate leaders was telling them if they wanna compete on the global stage, they have to do more to teach emotional intelligence to their people top person in the most populous country in the world is focusing on EI. It's a big deal. So we can start a conversation with coworkers and neighbors on emotional intelligence, but say, let me tell you about something even better. And we can introduce them to an even better formulation. Um, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna go through a few sections pretty quickly here. First of all, to point out that Although it'd be nice to live in this circle with all these wonderful skills all the time, we sometimes fly out of the circle because of our sinful fallen nature. Instead of remembering God, we forget God. Think of all the times in the Bible where it says, Israel forgot the Lord their God and nothing but grief came. Instead of being faithful, we're fickle. And that's a word that just means we're, we're inconsistent in our obedience. Sometimes we obey God and sometimes we don't. Instead of being humble because of our sin, we often wrestle with pride. Instead of being disciplined, we indulge or give in to our desires, our sinful desires. Instead of being compassionate toward others, we can be insensitive to them. Like that Russell Crowe movie where he wasn't hearing his wife and how the tension was building. And instead of serving other people, we manipulate other people. And you can evaluate every biblical character through this grid. Um, you look at Joseph who was in the circle almost all the time. He, he may have taunted his brothers a little bit, but there's no biblical record explicitly saying that. You've got Jacob who was inside and outside and inside. Most of the biblical characters struggled and stumbled at times. So that's real life. But what we wanna do is by God's grace, even if we have a problem where we often succumb to pride, by God's grace as sanctification works in us as we're being changed, as we're putting off the old self, as we're putting on the new self, by God's grace, we move from out here more and more consistently inside the circle. So even though we sort of live out here a lot when we're young and immature, by God's grace, as we grow and mature in our faith, we're more and more consistently living inside that circle. So that's the goal, relational wisdom. I wanna talk about the other two acrostics here that people find to be very useful. Um, one is what we call the read acrostic. And to, to become more self-aware and self-engaging. Learn to read yourself accurately. 
R-E-A-D. And again, we talked about emotions earlier. Emotions have power. They're like the wind to a sailor. And a good sailor knows how to anticipate the weather. You know, he sees when the clouds are building and the, the white caps are building. He knows this, there's more and more intense wind coming his way. And he trims his sail. He gets his hand on the tiller, changes his course, and he captures the power of the wind and uses it to, to propel him to his destination. So he knows there's a power there, but he knows how to harness that power. A poor sailor doesn't see that there's a storm brewing, leaves full sail up, doesn't have the right direction, and the wind hits him and he tips over. And that's how a lot of people are with emotions. They don't know how to anticipate them, they don't know how to control them. So the read acrostic is a way to, um, uh, to start learning the discipline of reading your emotions and actually learning how to process them. So the first step is to recognize the emotion. What am I feeling right now? And to name that emotion. Now, if I gave you a little opportunity to make some money, and I gave everyone in the room a piece of paper, and I said, write down all the emotional words you can write, and I'll give you a euro for every word on the piece of paper. The women in this room would walk out with twice as much money as the men. Consistently, when that exercise is done, women have a much richer, more diverse emotional vocabulary. In cowboy country, where I come from, a lot of the men have two emotional words. I'm good, not so good. I mean, they, they, just, <laughs> they don't talk about emotions. They don't think about emotions. They just do things. And so they often, if they can't describe their own emotions, how can they possibly understand the emotions of this other person? And one of the saddest things I've had to deal with in my life, I've done 600 divorce mediations. And there's a lot of couples that come together. There's this big, strong, you know, macho, masculine guy that's very appealing, very romantic uh, to someone. And uh, a woman is attracted to him because he's got this great physique and everything else. And she's attracted. They get married. And then she realizes he, he hasn't got the slightest idea what she's feeling. And we mistake romantic and sexual attraction and emotions for a real emotional connection. And that goes on a lot in American culture. And suddenly they're in the pastor's office counseling, and one of the most common things I hear from women in that situation is, he hasn't got a clue what's going on inside of me. Even when I try to tell him, he just doesn't get it. And part of it is we don't spend time teaching our children how to deal with emotions so they grow into adults who have a struggle. Now, th and this is aggravated, at least in America, by a false idea of what masculinity is. And we teach little boys, real men don't cry. Real men don't show their emotions. They're tough. And a little three-year-old boy or two-year-old boy falls down, skins his knee, starts to cry. and say, oh, man up. Men don't cry. Men don't show emotions. So from a very early age, we teach men to stuff their emotions, not to admit their weaknesses or their need, and they become emotionally stunted. And it creates a lot of difficulties. A lot of those men may grow and be pastors someday. They know the word of God, but they can't connect with their people. The good news is, even when people are raised like that and did not have the proper nurturing as young people, even at a later age in life, we can learn these things. We can grow in these areas. There are 60-year-olds who learn how to play the piano. We can learn how to deal with emotions. So this is just a simple way to start doing that. One of the things about recognizing emotions that's so significant, there's been some very interesting studies done to validate this, that when you recognize an emotion and you name it, let me just finish this one thing, I'll come back. When you actually name the emotion, you know, what am I feeling? Fear, anxiety, sadness, despair, joy, delight, anticipation. When you attach a word to the emotion, what it does, it forces your neocortex to get involved because your language skills are located up here, not in the limbic system. So if you're, if you're just feeling the intense emotion, your limbic system is churning. But when you name the emotion, you bring the rest of your mind into it. Just naming an emotion starts to engage your entire brain. Uh -huh. um, all, there's a lot of things we can go into more depth. We just don't have time. The second part of the read acrostic is to evaluate, why do I feel this way? What's going on inside of me? So I've named my emotion and I say, why? 
James 4, 1 and 2 says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your passions, your desires that war within you? What is it that I want so much that is causing me to speak harshly to my wife? Why did I lose my temper with my son? Um, why are there people in my church that I resent? And say, okay, here, I'm feeling resentment. Why? Well, some of these people have criticized me. They, they, they don't like my sermons. And I, I resent them. Why? Well, because I'm a people pleaser and I, I, I want to have the praise of men. And I want to know everyone to love me. And so there's a self-righteousness, a fear of man going on. So it helps us to dig into our own heart and find some things that are even corrupted in our own hearts, our own desires, our own priorities. So evaluating, why do I feel this way? Third is to anticipate the reaction or the consequences. If I give in to this feeling, what is likely to happen? <laughs> My supervisor criticized me in front of the team. I feel like just calling him an idiot. What's likely to happen? Probably not going to be helping my relationship with him or my coworkers. So we, we try to think through. Proverbs says, a wise man sees danger and takes refuge. He sees a risk coming and he charts a different course so he doesn't have this bad thing happen. So this is where, again, we're thinking, we're logically thinking, if I do this and I know my boss, this is what's likely to happen. And then finally, to direct that emotion in a constructive direction. Okay, I've got this strong emotion. How do I channel it in a constructive direction? Now, there's a couple of very simple ways to apply this. I'll just show them quickly to you. One is we just call the six-second rule. Um, there's a, probably the biggest emotional intelligence organization in the world, a global organization, is a group called Six Seconds. And they chose that name very deliberately because what they found was if you can wait just six seconds before you react to a strong emotional impulse, it gives your brain time to get in gear and to think. And so what I've actually counseled people, if you're going into a meeting and you're concerned that something's gonna happen that may provoke an angry outburst or just say something that's you know, ridiculous or silly, take a glass of water, take a bottle of water with you and just make up your mind that before you say anything, you'll take a sip and just buy your brain some time to think. Many of the lawsuits that I've mediated could have been prevented if people had waited six seconds to say something. Another thing is what we call the 180 rule, is to, as you recognize the emotion, you can do a quick little mental evaluation, say, now is this an emotion that is likely to lead me to do something that's pleasing to God, or is it likely to lead me to do something that's displeasing to God? And so compassion, kindness, gentleness, they're more likely to lead us to do good things that are pleasing to God. Things like anger, hatred, jealousy, they're more likely to move us in this direction. Not always. I'm jealous for my wife. If I saw someone else trying to flirt with her, I would, I would feel jealous. I would move in right away. Uh, I'm jealous for my children. If there's people pulling them away, I would react and say, no, no, come here. But jealousy often causes to do things that are hurtful. So if you do recognize an emotion that's inclined to lead you this way, often the safest thing to do, if it's, if it's likely to lead you in a negative way, is to figure out, okay, what do I feel like doing? And now I'll do exactly the opposite. It's a way of actually getting your bearings. Okay, I feel like punching this guy or saying something critical to this person. What can I do that's the opposite? Now you might think, and that sounds really strange, but let me just quote the most, the, the most relationally wise person who's ever walked the face of the earth, Jesus. Love your enemies. <laughs> Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. He's telling us to do exactly the opposite of what we feel like. Paul picks up this theme in Romans 12. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. So, bye-bye. <laughs> so, we just, it just sometimes ask ourselves, God, my emotions are leading me in this direction. Is this really where you want me to go or do you want me to do something different? And I've had to do this many times in my life where I really felt like going this way, and I said, God, this is what I feel like, 
But I believe this is the, the, the response that would be pleasing to you. Please give me grace to move in this direction. So, and what I would say about that read acrostic is practice it on the very little things in life. What I've been doing over the last few years is just, as I'm going through the day, I just sort of do a little quick mental check. How am I feeling right now? What's going inside my heart? If I'm now, I, I go out running in the morning and I, that's my quiet time alone, I just do a lot of introspection and what am I feeling? And some days I get up and I'm excited about the day. Why am I excited? Well, I've got this phone call with this ministry and I think they might really want to do a big training event and give us a chance to get out there and do our thing and all that. Other days I get up and I'm, man, I really don't want to do what I'm doing and feeling sort of down and discouraged. And Why am I feeling this way? Well, I got set back here and Carl and I had a disagreement last night and I know I didn't handle it well and my conscience is convicting me. But just on the little things in life, little things in life, just practice this thing, little thing, little thing. And then when a crisis hits, you've already begun to develop the habit of walking through that read acrostic. Don't wait for the big crisis to decide, okay, now I'm gonna act in a godly way. If you don't do it in the little things of life, it'll be too late when the crisis hits. Okay, let me give you the last acrostic. Look, first of all, I wanna give you a test. I'm gonna demonstrate how quickly you can learn to do things differently. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! This was an ad done by a British bicycling organization. And they're trying to encourage motorists to be looking for cyclists, okay? But what it demonstrates is a phenomenon known as selective perception. Selective perception. Just looking from this side of the room, across this side of the room, my, my brain, through the eyes, took in thousands of bits of information. There's different people, different facial expressions, clothing, hairstyle, all sorts of things just going like that. I can't consciously process all that. My brain doesn't have that power. So what the brain does, it develops a filtering mechanism where we pick up significant information and we put aside information that is not significant. And the result is that we tend to see things that we expect to see, that we're looking for, or we want to see. Which means if there's someone that you know that you think the world of, Everything you hear about that person that's good, you'll just say, oh yeah, see, it just proves he's wonderful. Anything is critical, you'll, no, no, no. But if there's someone you don't like, someone you're critical of, everything you hear that's critical, you'll just say, see, see, there he is again. That's the kind of person he is. And this goes on in politics. Uh, political processes are quickly polarized. You love this person and hate this person, and you can't change most voters' minds. They make up their minds very early, and they hold on to those perceptions. But what it means is, that we haven't, many of us have not developed our capacity to look and see important information. It just goes pew, right by us. The good thing is you can learn how to improve your capacity to be selective and pick up information. That story I told earlier this morning about the attorney who walked past me in a busy foyer and yet out of the corner of the eye, he just, he just picked up the look on my face, it communicated his brain, hey, there's someone distressed here, he turned around, he came back, and he ministered to me. He had developed that God-given capacity to use his eyes to collect data that was significant in helping him to love other people. So this is something we can develop. Let me give you just a way to start developing in a very deliberate way. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Sure, you bet. Um, how we can develop this capacity to grow in this skill. And this is what we call the serve acrostic. Again, these are very simple devices. You might think, oh, that's so simplistic. There's a difference between simplistic 
and simple. <laughs> simple means it's easy. We've reduced it down to the essentials. The metaphor I want you to think of, this is the picture I want stuck in your mind when you leave, is to be thinking of an eagle. Eagles are seen flying at elevations of 10 or 15,000 feet in the air. They don't have the strength to get there in their own power. There's just not enough energy stored in their body. So how does an eagle get up to those incredible high elevations? Catches a current, a thermal updrafts. And there's different things that cause warm air. There could be a plowed field or a weather front comes in, warm air over some cool air and it'll rise up over the top of it. Eagles fly around until they catch a thermal, they sense it, then they put their wings out, they spread their feathers wide, and it's like an elevator or a lift. It just takes them up. So I want you to think of yourself as a, a child of God called to love your neighbor as yourself that you want to be an updraft or a thermal for every person you meet. That anytime you encounter another person, somehow after that, after you go away, they're gonna go, whoo, I was lifted. I was encouraged. And here's some simple ways to do that, where you can encourage other people and lift them. So number one is smile. Now that may seem simplistic, and I do know that there's some different things going on in different cultures. Cultures with a high level of insecurity and inst instability, smiling is often looked at suspiciously, like what are you up to, you're insincere. But in most Western cultures, a smile is generally seen as a positive thing. It means that this person is happy to see me, is, is happy to engage me. Um, smiles, people that walk into a room and look a smile can affect other people. There's a concept called mirror neurons. When someone smiles at you, your brain sees that facial expression, it transmits a signal to your brain, your mirror neurons trigger like you're smiling and pretty soon you do smile and then you start feeling happy to see that person. It's a very interesting phenomena. Smiling links people emotionally. Smiling makes you look smarter, makes you look younger, makes you look more self-confident. People who smile in job interviews are more likely to get a job, okay? Um, one of the great actresses, uh, Meryl Streep, said the best facelift a woman can get is a smile, okay? It, it makes us look more attractive. Um, you can tell, people can tell on the other end of a phone, telephone line with 90% accuracy if someone is smiling on the other end of the phone. Because what a smile does, it changes the shape of the soft palate, the back of your throat, and your words sound more fluid. A friend of mine who has a company where he has employees on the phone selling things, on each, each person's desk, there's a mirror in front of the desk and a sign that says, smile and dial. And if he sees an employee on the phone talking to a customer and they're not smiling, he'll go, because he knows he makes more money when his people are smiling. Very interesting. Um, there's a blog on our website called The Seven Benefits of a Smile, and they are profound. When you walk into the office in the morning, do you walk in like this? Nobody's going to be too excited. But when you walk in and you smile at people, it, it, it lifts their day. It puts wind under their wings. I think especially when you wake up in the morning, if you're married, what's the first thing your spouse sees? <laughs> Is it grumpy and sad? Or do you smile and say, so glad to see you. Good morning. Happy to be married to you. We've got a young couple here that's smiling at each other. They're obviously connecting with us. Good. Okay, second thing, explore and empathize. Ask questions. Um, I am a natural, born, hardcore, card-carrying introvert. I, it, it takes energy for me to engage people. I, my happy place is at a cabin in the mountains with my wife and my dog. I just love being there. And then bring my kids and my grandkids, and that's just wonderful. But add other people, and it takes work for an introvert to engage other people. And I don't naturally engage people. When I get on an airplane, I sit down with my book and don't even talk to the other person. That's my nature, okay? But I'm changing, and I am so thankful. I'm learning how to engage people. And one of the revelations to me was what exhausts me in a lot of uh, human interactions is small talk. So, 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 is this your third year at ELF? Oh, I don't know. What, what did you enjoy? And uh, where are you from? You know, just coming up with the next question, it's exhausting. But when I can get into 
conversation on things that have meaning and tap into emotion and story, that energizes me, even as an introvert. So I'm changing, I'm growing. And the thing I would say is think of yourself, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, it's like a football field with boundaries. And our, you know, someone's field may be here, another person's field may be here, but within the boundaries of my God-given personality, I can grow and change. I can move from being very isolated and withdrawn and not wanting to engage people, that I can learn to engage, ask questions, care about people. One of the most important things I did was I said, Lord, change my heart. I would love people. I realized at the heart of my relational difficulty, I didn't really love people very much. I loved me. I said, help me to care about other people, to have compassion. And then I learned some actual skills. And so exploring, for example, one of the things that, a question, I, when I travel a lot, people will often ask me out for dinner after a seminar. And I found, used to find that to be very exhausting because you have to come up with conversation. But I've learned there's some questions you can ask in that setting that actually make for a stimulating conversation. So one of them is, if there's some couples, married couples at, at the table, um, one of the things I'll ask after we've just relaxed a little bit with each other, I'll say, tell me something. When you first started dating, what character quality did you see in the other person that made you think this could be the one? I say, now character quality, not that she was cute or he was handsome, but character quality. And you can see the tone at a table change when you ask that question. So you go, woo, and they start thinking. And I remember the first time I did this, one of the men said, uh, uh, Cindy and I went out for a walk on the beach on our first date, and a little kitten came out of the bushes, and she leaned down and picked up, it was holding it, and I just thought, wow, she's going to make an amazing mother someday. And everyone at the table just went, oh, it feels good. It feels good when people affirm other people, especially their spouse. One of the false ideas of masculinity in the U.S. is that men tease each other. They joke with each other, and they often do it with their wives, and they often say things about their wives in front of other people that they think are funny that actually embarrass their wives. It's a very destructive habit. I have fallen into it. I've had friends come to me and confront me about things that I said in public about my wife, just joking, who said, you know, I think you're embarrassing Corlette. And I thank God I've got brothers who love me enough to come and confront me, because they were absolutely right. It was totally wrong. So we can learn how to explore, ask questions. Here's another question. If you're with people, if you want to get them thinking, just say, what would you do tomorrow? if you knew you could not fail. What would you do tomorrow if you knew you could not fail? What do you tap into with that question? Dreams. And they're often dreams they had 20 years ago put into a closet and have not even thought about in 20 years. And you can bring those dreams back out. I did that with one couple, and they both shared some dreams about being a missionary and teaching at a university. There, he was an attorney, his wife was his paralegal. I asked that question, he said he always wanted to teach, be a, a college professor, and she always wanted to be a missionary in Africa. And when they said that, they looked at each other and said, that's still your dream? They had shared that years ago, and then got into this life of law and mortgage and raising kids, and hadn't even talked about their dreams. When you get into dreams and stories that have emotion, that's where you get to connect with people and you find ways to lift them, to encourage them. Also to empathize, developing the gift of empathy. We've seen that in many of the clips we've looked at today where people can feel what someone else is feeling. They're reading their body language, they're imagining how they're feeling, they're leaning in, they're asking questions, they're showing compassion, a lot of things there. There's a blog on our website this is the address, just go to the website and put in slash empathy and there's a whole article on how to develop this skill of empathy. Third thing, reconcile, is looking for times when there's a strain in your relationship with someone or maybe some coworkers have had some estrangement and you need to help them come together. Valuing other people. Do we go to 1230? Is that right? Um, yeah. Okay, we have some questions. Okay, just wanted to check. Um, and by the way, on the reconcile is also, most importantly, looking for those moments when God has opened a heart 
to the gospel. You've built a relationship. You've shown empathy. You've shown friendliness. And God is, you just sense this is a time to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the most important reconciliation we can do, reconciling people to God, valuing people, showing appreciation, being thankful for what they do. Um, I love traveling with Corlette. One of her beautiful habits, many beautiful habits, is as we go through security at airports, she will look for the security guards, go out of her way to walk up to them and say, I just want to thank you for the work you do to be here today to protect me and keep us safe. How often do you think they hear that? Every day they put their lives on the line and most of them would gladly put themselves between us and someone who assault us to protect us. And yet most times there's thousands of people who walk past them and never say thank you. Corlette was, we were traveling recently and um, after we got off a plane, we both went in the restroom. I was waiting outside and Corlette comes out and she's talking to this woman in this very animated way. This woman is just very excited and they chat for a moment and then they leave. And I say, what happened? <laughs> And when Corla went into the room, there was a, uh, a custodian in there cleaning the restroom. And so Corla went up to the woman after she was done and she said, I want to thank you for the work you do and having such a nice restroom in this, this uh, airport. We love flying through this airport and you do such a good job. And this custodian was just like her eyes got like, whoa. But there was another woman in the restroom who overheard Corla do this. And as she was coming out, she, this other woman walked up and said, I've never seen anyone do that before. Where did you learn that? And Corla just began sharing with her the idea of relational wisdom. And as they came out, this woman said, I'm gonna start doing that in my life. Mm -hmm. So there's an example when we value others, we can encourage them. So then finally, the last one is to encourage. And that sums up everything. The word encourage means to give courage, to infuse with courage, to inspire people. And when you do that, you're actually putting this wind under their wings. You're lifting them up and encouraging them. Let me give you a simple illustration of how I've, how I've done this. I was flying um, on a trip one time, came through Dulles Airport very early in the morning. I needed a cup of coffee. There was a Starbucks kiosk. I walked over to it. There was a couple of young ladies there. It was really early in the morning. They looked sort of, you know, haven't fully awakened yet, just sort of blank faces. Um, it was early, so they probably got up at 4.30 or something to, to be there. So I walked over there and I ordered a, a, a latte from the one young lady, and the barista was busy completing the drink for the previous customer who's standing right over here beside me. As I was looking over the top of the counter, I was watching her prepare the latte, and she put the foam in the cup, and then she took a syrup dispenser and put this beautiful pattern. I mean, how they do that is just, is just amazing to me. It's artistic. So she put this beautiful pattern on it, and then she was grabbing a plastic lid to put on top of the cup. So I'm looking over the top of the thing, I see this going on, and I did something that's totally out of character for an introvert. I engaged her. <laughs> and I leaned forward, I said, don't do that. And she looked up at me like she was in trouble, and I gave her a big smile to let her know she's not in trouble. I said, it's so beautiful, show him the, the, the pattern. And she didn't, she was like, what's going on here? She was sort of confused for a moment. But fortunately, the guy who, the customer, heard what I said, he got into it, says, yes, I'd like to see it. And so she put the cup on the counter without the lid, and he looked and says, that is beautiful, thank you so much. He pulled out an extra dollar and put it in the tip jar. <laughs> took his coffee, walked away. Well, I, I look at her at this point, I mean, her eyes are like this, she's smiling from here to here, her face is lit up, and I, I looked at her, I said, how long have you worked at Starbucks? And she said, three months, I just moved here from Ethiopia. So here she is in a new country, a young woman, away from her family, unsure of her future, and someone just encourages her. And I smiled at her, I said, you know, with that kind of customer service, you're gonna own Starbucks someday. And she just, her face just exploded. And as I walked away, I knew there was wind under her wings. But here's something else. There was wind under my wings. Proverbs 11.25, and I, the, the citation is miswritten in your book. I've got 125. But Proverbs 11.25 says that when we encourage others, when we refresh others, I could get myself on the right page, page 29. When we refresh others, we ourselves are refreshed. And just think about it. Think about the movie I showed you very beginning this morning, the, the football players. They, they, 
encourage another little boy, let him make a goal. And Justin Miller said, I was grinning from here to here. I was just so happy. When we refresh others, when we love others, we open ourselves to have more of God's grace flow into us. It's sort of like God says, I gave you a quarter, you spent it well, here's a dollar. You know, as we use these resources, they flow through us. So to wrap this, one last video to show this quality, and then we're gonna have some Q&A. Um, I wanna show you a video back from that um, uh, movie Russell Crowe, and where he's the boxer, he's struggling to make, make a living, everything else. Well, he finds out before the big fight, comes home from the docks one day, hasn't been able to earn much money that day, he's just distressed and down, and he notices, or he finds out that his son has been stealing food. I don't know how you are, but most people, when your, your child does something really bad, your first reaction is, you know, what are people gonna think of me? I'm a bad dad. And there can be anger, you can, you know, violently, you know, physically hit a child. All sorts of things happen when our children provoke us. And, but I want, I want you to watch and see how differently he handles this. He, there's some very strong emotions he's feeling, and you can see his muscles almost tighten up, but he doesn't take it out on his son. He immediately takes that energy and moves into some kind of constructive action. He directs the emotion. Um, he doesn't blow up at his child. And you'll just see how he handles this in a very relationally wise way. I want you to be watching his body language, facial expressions, tone of voice. All these things are communicating a lot of things to his son. When he finally understands why his son sold, sold stole food, um, you'll see him tense up, his muscles tense, and he, he looks up the street, he looks down the street, he's wrestling with some very strong feelings. I want you to tell me what you think that is, and then watch how he engages his son, and especially try to watch for how he changes his use of pronouns, okay? Pronouns, he goes from talking about you to using the pronoun we. I want you to tell me why you think that is significant. doing son I'm being good I'm being quiet I'm being hate great <laughs> daddy daddy hey Rosie Cheek how you doing daddy Jay Storr what Jay Storr what's all this about see it's a salon young lady your brother's in enough trouble without you telling on him. You understand? It's from the butchers. And he won't say a word about it, will you, Jay? Will you, Jay? Okay, pick it up, let's go. Do not test me, boy. Right now. Howard, stay here. Johnson had to go away to Delaware to live with his uncle. Why? His parents didn't have enough money for them to eat. Yeah, well, things ain't easy at the moment, Jay. You're right. There's a lot of people worse off than what we are. And just because things ain't easy, that don't give you the excuse to take what's not yours, does it? That's stealing, right? We don't steal. No matter what happens, we don't steal. Not ever. You got me? Are you giving me your word? Yes. Go on. I promise. And 
I promise you, we will never send you away. It's okay, kid. You got a little scared, I understand. Now, that's an example where he could have been emotionally hijacked, had some strong emotions. They could have just spilled out in anger. He could have smacked his kid across the room, said some hurtful things, later on regretted it, but imprinted on his son's mind something that he'd remember the rest of his life. But instead, because he was able to manage his emotions, channel their power, take time to really use his mind, he created an incident this child remember the rest of his life in a positive way. I had an, a very similar experience of my own at that age where I deserved some very serious discipline from my father and instead he reacted like that. I can still remember that. It's a defining moment for my father, his kindness, his compassion, his gentleness. So let's talk for just a moment about that whole incident. Um, what, what was the assumption? I know you've got to leave. Thank you so much. Okay, God bless. Okay. Um, if anyone else needs to, obviously, can slip out. Um, but anyway, he, did you notice his facial expressions? They weren't harsh and angry. He, he wasn't smiling. Russell Crowe's not a big smiler. But there was a friendly countenance as he engaged his son. He took time to find out. He didn't jump to conclusions. God bless. He took time to find out. And by just controlling his anger... He was sending the message, my emotions are in control. It's safe for you to talk to me. Dad is not out of control. The little boy says, okay, I can talk to my father. I can share what's going on. And he finds out he wasn't stealing just because he was hungry. One of the first clues was in the scene, did you notice that the salami was not cut into? The boy had not stolen it, hidden it away, and just cutting off little pieces for himself. He brought it to the family, knowing he would be in trouble. And yet if they had food, at least you wouldn't be sent away. That was the real issue, fear of being separated from his family. And so obviously, credible evidence of reconciliation, the little boy throwing himself into his father's arms. Um, did you notice his body language? How, how was his body language, his position with his son significant? Yeah, at first he's up high. I remember one time when my son Jeff was little and he'd done something and I was lecturing him and he was you know, he's down here and his dad is six foot four. And I suddenly realized, this is very intimidating, very frightening. And so Russell Crowe gets down, he kneels, he bends down, and he's actually down on his knees below his son's eyes. I, I, I doubt that the screenwriter, you know, built this in deliberately as a Christian, maybe as a believer, maybe not. But I think God, God is up in heaven editing films and books all the time moving us to write stories that can be used to display biblical truth and wisdom. You bet. Thank you. And, and what I thought of when that scene where he gets down below his son, law comes from on high. Law and judgment come from Mount Sinai down to the people, from the parent down to the child. Grace comes from below. Jesus lowered himself. He came down from heaven. The incarnation, he lowered himself and took our sins on his shoulder to lift us up. It's just a beautiful, uh, to me, that's what I think of when I see that scene. And then finally, just the, the pronoun. Let's just talk about the pronoun for just a minute. When he, at the end, he says, you know, just because we don't have enough food, it doesn't give you the right to steal. We don't steal. Why is that change of pronoun significant? What message does it send? Yeah, yeah, we're together. The little boy's biggest fear is being separated, and the father is using every means at his disposal to send the message, we're together. We're in this together. We're not going to be separated, even his pronouns. Do you use your pronouns that deliberately? Do you understand the power of your words? The words we use, the pronouns, the inflection, the warmth of our voice, our body language. These are gifts God gives to us to communicate, to build relationship, to send signals of love and empathy and compassion. Now, most of us, we haven't developed these things 
to their fullest potential. But just as in that, that movie, that um, awareness test, the first time you watched that, most of you were watching the ball and did not see the moonwalking bear. That's my case. But in the second one, you're now looking for the moonwalking bear and you see it. And that's what can happen as you now focus on these issues in life, in these opportunities, in these ways to relate to people. You can start seeing things and making the most of opportunities to love other people within your family, your staff, people outside your ministry.